Hey everybody, welcome back to Inscription. I'm Father Joshua Whitfield. In this episode, we look at chapter 6, verses 14 through 29, the story of the death of John the Baptist. But before we begin, as we always do, we begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord God, Holy Father, be now and forever blessed. For as you will, so it has been done, and what you do is good. Let your servant rejoice in you, not in myself or in any other. You alone are my true joy. You are my hope and my crown. You are my gladness and my honor. O Lord, what has your servant, but what has been received from you without deserving it? Yours are all things that you have given and have made. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's uh, go ahead and read the passage in question, verses uh, 14 through 29, beginning uh, at verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why he, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. But Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and kept him safe. When he heard him, he was much perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. But opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will grant it. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard and gave orders to bring his head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. In the last episode, in, in the previous passage, verses uh, 7 through uh, 13, rather, uh, we uh, see the disciples sent out on mission by Jesus. When we come around to verse 30 in the next episode, uh, we will see the disciples coming back uh, from that mission uh, to tell Jesus all that they had done and taught, it says there in verse 30. So in between the going out and the coming in of the disciples on their first uh, missionary activities, uh, we have this story, Mark tells this story of the death of John the Baptist. Uh, Mark tells us of his arrest at the very beginning of the gospel in uh, chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, but only now he gives us the details of his death, uh, practically simultaneously, uh, as he tells us of the first mission of the disciples, and, and, and obviously for a reason. Uh, this story uh, shows... Um, us that, that, that John foreshadows Jesus in his death. Uh, but, but also the story, by, by implication, shows that, that Jesus foreshadows John in his resurrection, right? So, so 
So John foreshadows Jesus in his death, and Jesus foreshadows John in his resurrection, that the reader who, who has heard the gospel and who believes the gospel uh, gets that when hearing this story. Um, and, and again, you know, we might touch upon this once or twice in this particular episode. That, that would have been a provocative, powerful, and, and comforting story to hear if you were a first century Christian, perhaps in Rome, where this may have been written, uh, surrounded by, by potential uh, persecutors, right? Especially if this uh, gospel was, was heard by Christians who also knew the name Nero, right? Um, so it's a remarkable story to, 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 to hear and to think of its original uh, context in which it would have been heard. Uh, this is, is a story, um, the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. It's a story about the relationship of Christ, the relationship of prophecy, the relationship of believers, etc., etc., uh, to power, uh, to, to royal power, to political power. There, there are echoes of the story of Esther. There are echoes of, of the, the story of Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. There is in this story the contrast, the implicit contrast between the, the, the dinners Jesus held with sinners in chapter 2, you remember. Uh, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? Um, and, and, and this corrupt political banquet. Uh, there's also the, the implied contrast between the Last Supper and, and Herod's um, quite grotesque uh, supper. Right, so all, all, that's, all that's going on. Uh, and also, we could see the story as an, as an illustration of, of what Jesus talked about in chapter 4 in the parable of, of, the, seed, uh, of the sower, right? Uh, that is, the, the, the seed word uh, falls on, on thorny ground, on rocky ground, uh, and, and, and there might be some sort of reception to the word. Uh, but but it doesn't take root, right? If you if you remember from uh, um, Mark chapter four, uh, f for example, verse sixteen, and, and these in like manner are the, are the ones sown upon rocky ground, who when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately fall away. We, we, when we looked at that uh, a few episodes ago, we saw that. Uh, in terms of, you know, early Christians under persecution who were faltering, you know. Um, but here we also see it as a commentary uh, on Herod himself because, because he, he likes, he's perplexed, right, it says, and he, and he, and he likes listening to John the Baptist and he, and he protects him, uh, but, but he is no match for Herodias and, and, and her uh, commitment to... Um, to, to kill John the Baptist, right? And so, and so you see in Herod um, someone who who hears the gospel, hears the truth, but but is utterly, completely weak, right? Um, which which is itself is sort of a commentary on on um, people who pretend to have power, political power, and 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 all of that. So let's just dive into the text, verse fourteen. Uh, King Herod heard of it. Um, it presumably the, the mission of the twelve. Why? Because, as it says, Jesus' name had become known, his reputation. We have heard that since uh, John chapter 1, that the Jesus, Jesus movement gathers all sorts of crowds, and, 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 and he has gone viral. He's become famous. Um, now, this King Herod is not Herod the Great, but one of uh, Herod the Great's uh, sons. Uh, Herod the Great had uh, many sons, uh, many wives, like ten wives, something like that, and and Herod, uh, this Herod is is uh, the Herod the Tetrarch, as Matthew and Luke would call him, Herod Antipas. Um, Jesus called him a fox in, in Luke's gospel. Th this is uh, the Herod who would agree to Jesus's execution. Um, you know, th th he he was a client. Um, king, uh, 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 although calling him king is slightly ironic here, uh, he was a client of Rome. Uh, after Herod the Great, uh, Herod the Great's territory was divided up in, into bits and pieces, and, and Herod Antipas uh, 
got Galilee and Perea, another territory. Um, and, and so the Herod family is, is you know, uh, quite a remarkable soap opera of a family um, that, that, that it, it's a bloody grotesque history, uh, that, that family, and this is just uh, one representative of that family. Um, his ambition would be his downfall, so jo Josephus, Josephus would say. Um, and, and so you see here his pretensions of power, because he'll say some things that, you know, he has no uh, power to, to fulfill. Um, and, and it's that pride, it's that ambition, it's that political bravado uh, for which he is remembered, you know, as, as a failure. Uh, Josephus uh, talks, about, uh, talks about that. Um, but he hears of Jesus, right? And, and so, uh, you know, one thing people who, who have ambition for fame are interested in is other people who have fame. And so clearly uh, his ears perked uh, up. Uh, this is an interesting contrast to the, the beginning of chapter 6 where, where Jesus is just rejected out of hand, you know, um, by, by those most familiar with him. Herod, however, uh, is interested. And so, and so, at the second half of verse 14, some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Uh, this is why these powers are at work in him. Uh, but others said it is Elijah. Others said it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. So, so we'll come across this in, in chapter 8 again, when, when uh, just before Peter pr professes the faith that, that Jesus is the Christ, uh, we'll, we'll come across the same sort of litany of opinion, which, which sort of you know, illustrates the spiritual confusion, the theological confusion surrounding Jesus and who Jesus was. Some very strange views uh, from, from a Jewish perspective, for example, the idea that John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and is sort of reincarnate or, or redivivus, so to speak, um, revived in Jesus. That, that's a very bizarre uh, view that, that's foreign to Jewish uh, thinking. Um, there's also the, the sort of hint that may, maybe Jesus is possessed by a spirit of something because it talks about these powers, this dunamis, which Jesus is clearly manifested. But, but the way it says is that these powers are at work in him, right? So there's a suggestion that maybe he's possessed. Um, verse 15 talks about Elijah, right? But others said it's Elijah. Now this is a bit more of an understandable uh, belief in, in Jewish terms because Elijah... It was was uh, assumed in heaven. You know, two people in the Old Testament were assumed in heaven: Enoch in Genesis chapter five, and uh, Elijah. And and it and it became the belief. The belief emerged that that Elijah would return to prepare the, for the day of the Lord. Right? If you read the end of Malachi, uh, Malachi chapter four, and and, and throughout the New Testament, uh, John the Baptist is is identified in 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 different ways. Uh, with Elijah, as as we will see, and of course, what's interesting about the Elijah illusion is, is is that Elijah was quite an opponent of royal power as well. I mean, he he did battle uh, with Ahab and and Jezebel, as as we know, All right? And then the other says it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. Again, sort of a general assumption that Jesus is like a prophet. This isn't. This isn't sort of a specific, he is the prophet, this prophet like unto Moses. We get that elsewhere in the Gospels. Um, so, so Mark gives us a, a, a brief little sort of uh, snapshot, thumbnail sketch of, of uh, standing opinion uh, about Jesus of Nazareth. Um, but Herod, in verse 16, he is convinced. It says, when, when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised, right? Um, so maybe it's, it's his guilty conscience speaking, um, and, you know, and, and he's convinced that this is John the Baptist come back to haunt him, perhaps. Um, note here, it's the second time we've come across the verb raised, where we talk about John the Baptist um, being raised there in, in verse 14. John the Baptist has been raised, and, 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 and Herod in verse 16 said, John whom I beheaded has been raised, right? Again, so Mark is sort of you know, drip, 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 this illusion, uh, this, uh, this illusion, this identification between what happens to John the Baptist will happen to Jesus, right? Uh, 
and then comes a, 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 a flashback, a, a retrospective, um, much like you'd see in a movie, right? Because there in verse uh, 14, it says, it says, for Herod had sent. So we're flashing back. Uh, to, 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 to a past time. You know, again, it's, it's cinematic almost, right? Um, for Herod uh, had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. Um, so to, this explains why, you know, Herod Antipas... Uh, thought it was John the Baptist, right? This, this explains why um, he had a guilty conscience. The, on, the only other account of sort of the, the arrest of John the Baptist comes from uh, the Jewish historian Josephus in his uh, book Antiquities, and, and Mark's account and um, the Gospel's account and, and uh, Josephus's account uh, differ somewhat considerably. Uh, the presumption here in Mark's Gospel is that this is taking place in Galilee. Uh, Josephus puts it in, in um, uh, a, a place called Machiris in in, in um, the northeast corner of the Dead Sea, right? So it's a, it's in a different locale. Doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, those differences of detail, uh, but but it, it it is interesting as well here uh, that that Mark gets a little bit confused on detail, and then since he says for Herod had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's. Uh, wife. Now, now this is confusing and inaccurate, uh, but of course it's very understandable. You see, Herod, Herod the Great had, as I said, like ten wives, and, and um, he had many sons and grandsons whom uh, they they um, you know rather humbly named Herod. And so, so you have a quite a few uh, Herods running around all in the same family. And, and what we can gather is that that Herodias was originally married to another guy named Herod, not the Herod in the passage, but to another guy named Herod. And, and, and with that Herod, he had uh, Salome, and, and the, the, the daughter who, who um, Josephus names her Salome. We don't get her name in Mark's Gospel, but she's identified with, as the dancer, right? And, and um, that's the daughter of Herodias and the daughter of another dude named uh, Herod, not the Herod in question, are you confused yet? Right, and, and Salome married another half brother of Herod Antipas, who who was named Philip. Right, and and, and so um, Mark's just a bit confused, but as you can say, so are we, and and it's certainly understandable, and it doesn't ruin the point. Right, um, now now as the story goes, you know. Uh, John accuses Herod Antipas of violating Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 9, or chapter 20, um, a, a, about uh, marrying your brother's uh, wife. To marry your brother's wife is to violate that law. Um, now Josephus, in his account, doesn't doesn't mention this at all. Uh, Josephus's view is, is that Herod Antipas. Um, pragmatically feared John the Baptist's growing fame, right? And so therefore, you know, you, you crush your rivals. Uh, Mark's account of motive and Josephus's account of motive don't necessarily conflict, but, but uh, J Josephus does not talk about, um, uh, you, you know, the, the accusation that um, Herod Antipas was violating the Levitical law uh, at all. Um, so, so that's why John the Baptist, uh, according to Mark, was uh, critical of Herod Antipas and why he was seized and arrested because he was accusing uh, this this uh, Jewish client king uh, of violating Torah, right? Of violating uh, Jewish law. And as we'll see, Herod is, is, is mimicking, is parroting the, the ways and the ethics and the debauchery of, of Hellenistic power, right? And so, and so there's a deep sort of religious and cultural critique going on. Um, and, and, and Herod probably doesn't want to hear it. Um, it, it it's, it's as if 
uh, a prophet were to stand up and, and to say today to some Catholic politician, which by the way would be very easy to do, and, and, and say to that Catholic politician, um, you are not being a good Catholic, right? Or you're not being a Christian, right? That the Catholic politician um, would clearly not buy that and, and, and probably would turn a commercial in it, into it, you know. So, so that's what, that's what on the surface John the Baptist was doing, right? He was telling Herod, you're behaving more like a Greek, you know, despot, uh, not a good Jew, right? And, and, and Herod Antipas was bothered by that. Uh, Herodias, as we see in, in verse 19, uh, really wasn't buying it uh, because it says, and Herodias had a grudge against him wanted, and wanted to kill him, right? So you get this sort of, um, Herodias had a grudge against him, it really, literally says had it out for him, uh, wanted to kill him, but he couldn't, but she couldn't, right? So uh, grudge, wanting to kill, but couldn't, stifled, she stifled in, in her plans. And, and at this point, we've already had allusion to Elijah, and, and here's John the Baptist, like Elijah, confronting somewhat royal power. And you have Herodias, uh, the wife of, the, of the, that royal power, is, is plotting to kill him. So immediately anybody with two cents of Old Testament knowledge thinks Ahab and Jezebel, right? Because Jezebel went after Elijah with a uh, passion, you know, if you read First Kings. Um, verse 20. Uh, for Herod feared John, uh, knowing that he was a holy and righteous man, and kept him safe. Very interesting, right? Um, Herodias uh, it is, has it out for him and wants to kill him, uh, but she can't. And that's because Herod fears the prophet because he, he understands that he's righteous. He understands that he that he's pious. He, uh, that he that he has piety. That is that he's in he's in right relationship with with God and, and, and man, right? And, and 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 so he protects this prophet, right, from from Herodias. Uh, you see in here, by the way, uh, you know if if you go back and read the books of the kings, right, First and Second Kings, um, you 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 see this this great narrative tension between. Uh, the prophets and, and the kings, right? The prophets have their, their their own line of succession, and the kings do too, right? And so that so the, the the meta commentary is 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 really a question, you know, uh, on 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 what does history rest, right? The history of the prophets or the history of kings, right? And so there's this great great uh, drama, this great this great tension, this great question. Uh, you know, what determines the, the significance of history? Is, is it political power? Is it royal power? Or is it God and his prophets, right? And so, so that's the big question uh, going underneath all of this. And, and so to dive back into the verse, you know, um, Herod feared John because he understands he's holy and he's righteous. And, and so he keeps him safe for that reason. It says, when he heard him, he was much perplexed, and, and yet he heard him gladly, right? So, so this is what make, gets you thinking about the parable of the sower, uh, John chapter four, verse sixteen and seventeen, because clearly he he likes what he hears in a sense, but but he it does not take root, right? Because the, he's shallow, and 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 and, and so the, his his gladness, his his joy is superficial, and it will end, as it says, in verse twenty six, with exceeding sorrow, right? And so it's a commentary on on us on how, on how we receive truth too, you know. Um, so verse, verse 21, uh, but an opportunity uh, came, an opportunity came. So, so you get the sense of scheme, uh, of, of sinister plot afoot. Um, so, so an opportunity came when Herod, uh, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and his officers and the leading men of Galilee. So, first things first, um, you know, celebrating one's birthday um, was more of, was not quite a Jewish thing. Um, it was more of a, a Gentile thing, a secular thing, a pagan thing. And so, you know, that's a tip of the hat to, to, to show where um, Herod's cultural um, habits 
are, right? Uh, they're, they're, he's not a good Jew, you know? Um, th there might also be sort of an, an implied um, sort of irony here because the, the word for birthday that, that Mark uses is genesia, which in classical Greek is, is, is used um, to, to it, it's, it's used to, de to, to describe uh, the memorial of, of someone's death, not just their birth. The different phrase is used for birthday as we understand it. And so, so you know, and this is the day that John the Baptist died. And so, and so there might be some sort of irony at work there in the specific sort of Greek word that Mark uses to, to, for birthday there. But, but you see this, this grand political banquet again, which is set up in contrast to, to, the, to the dinners that Jesus held with sinners, to, to, the, to the last supper that Jesus would have with his disciples, wherein he would say, you know, you're not going to, uh, you're, you're, you're not supposed to lord it over like the Gentiles do, you know, the greatest among you will be your servant, right? And so, and so there, there's this great contrast between, between the elite power sort of collected in sort of pathetic despots and their courts like Herod Antipas and, and the kingdom of God, right? Uh, and, and I think it's clear that we're supposed to sort of have that contrast uh, working in our brains, right? And and so, um, and and also, again, to sort of hear these stories with the depth of um, the Old Testament, right? Again, you're thinking of the stories of Esther. You're thinking of, of Elijah versus Ahab and, and Jezebel. Um, and, and so the story gets interesting uh, in verse 22 uh, for. For when Herodias' daughter, whom Josephus identified as Salome, um, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. Uh, and the king said to the girl, Now, um, sometimes this is depicted as sort of like a sexual thing, but there's, no, there's nothing in the text to suggest that anything sexual is going on here. Um, uh, you, you know, and the, the word for girl there in verse 22 um, it's the same word used to describe the twelve-year-old uh, in in chapter five, right? So, so this could be a young girl dancing, and it says, you know, she pleased Herod, but there, but there's no sexual connotations there, um, although although sometimes it it is depicted that way, but there's no need to read it that way. Um, it, it, so it could literally could go e either way, really. But um, but he pleases Herod, uh, or she pleases Herod. Uh, by her dance, and, and 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 then Herod, because he, he, by now we see that he's sort of a weak dude, um, set, does something dumb, you know, and 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 he says he he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom. Now, a few things are funny about this. One, he vowed, right? So in in Judaism and in Christianity, especially early Christianity, um, there was a real sort of caution about about oaths and taking oaths. You know, read, read um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, um, where Jesus decidedly talks against taking oaths. Um, and, uh, good Jews ha had the same sort of uh, caution about, about uh, taking oaths. But, but here, in the context of a party, Herod has no problem with making an oath, so he vows to her, right? So it's, again, another sort of indication that, that the Herod, uh, the Jewish despot, is, is not a good Jew. And, and and on top of that, he's dumb, right? So because so, he says, "Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom." This this in Arthurian literature is called a rash boon, right? It's making a promise you can't keep, or a promise that would ruin you. Politically, he couldn't keep it because he couldn't give half of his kingdom if he wanted to, because he's a client of Rome, right? You know, he he, he that's not his to give. So it's obviously a hyperbole. It's foolish. Um, it is, you know, a rash boon. I love that that old ancient uh, Celtic literary term. And, and, but she she takes it and runs with it. She she says, um, uh, and by the way, you come across I have put notes down. You come across the rash boon twice in uh, the book of Esther, right? And and it's how Esther sort of plots her way to get revenge on Haman and to save her people, because um, he says, you know, uh, Xerxes says to her, says, you know. I'll give you anything you want. And she goes, well, let's have a banquet. I'll give you anything you want. Well, let's save my people. And, and long story short, Haman ends up hung, you know. So um, so Salome, the, the daughter here, is, plays it uh, as smart as Esther did, but uh, for 
for, but she's a bad guy, right? Um, uh, and, and, and so she, she, in verse 24, it says she went out, and immediately she goes out to her mother, and she goes, what shall I ask? So, so Herodias is behind the scenes there, plotting the whole thing. Um, and, and, and she says to her daughter, the head of John the Baptist, right? Everything starts moving very quickly here. Um, violence and, and politics scheme quickly. Uh, in verse 25, and she came in immediately, right away it says, uh, with haste to the king. So, And she came in immediately with haste. So she's running, right? Um, probably before Herod sobers up, perhaps, or changes his mind, right? Um, and as saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter, right? So he, he, the, maybe, he, maybe you, you see here um, the daughter's youthful zeal, because the, the mom just asked for the head of John the Baptist. And the daughter asks, um, she puts a little uh, finishing touch on it, on a platter, please, you know, uh, a really sort of macabre request. Um, and what? Verse 26. The king was exceedingly sorry, right? Crestfallen. Why? Because he liked listening to the guy. He was sort of enigmatically entranced by the guy. But because of his character, because of his weakness, because of his ambition, because of his stupidity, he gets himself in a corner, and, he, and, he, and he's sorry. He's like the rich young man who walks away sorrowful, right? And it's a true emotional sort of sorrow. Um, it, it's the same sort of, it's the same Greek that Jesus would say later on in chapter 14 in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he says, my soul is sorrowful even unto death, right? It's the same sort of, you know, brutal sorrow that, that Mark's trying to get across. Why? because he knows he's locked in because of his oaths, it says, and because of his guest, and he didn't want to break his word with her, right? And so, so what you show here is, is the bravado of political power, which really actually is hemmed in by, you know, complex political relationships, which limit your power, right? And so, and so that's, you know, that's the difference between the, the, the way the kingdom of God works and the kingdom of men and women work, right? So, so Jesus stands in front of Pilate and says, you have no power over me, right? He transcends the, the, the pathetic um, sort of complexity of human politics. Uh, Herod cannot escape that, right? Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's the contrast Christians are, are meant to, uh, to, to grasp, right? Um, and so, and immediately, the violence is going quick, and immediately the king sent a soldier, an executioner um, to, uh, of the guard, and gave orders to bring his head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, right? Um, you know, again, the idea, the, the idea is, um, you know, if it's in Galilee, maybe there was a prison nearby, or if it's in this macarious place where Josephus said, you know, uh, who, the, who, who really knows? The idea is, is, is that is that once the conspiracy gets rolling, once the politics gets rolling, violence happens very, very quickly, right? Um, uh, tragedy suddenly befalls us. Uh, and, and again, that's just a truth you see throughout the history of humanity. Um, as I point out, if you read the Bible from beginning to end, uh, you, you, you get to the first homicide in chapter four, right? <laughs> it takes four chapters. Uh, of the Bible to to get to to, to murder, um, and by the sixth chapter of the book of, the, of Genesis, God says there in verse six, I, "I regret having made them." Right, so things go bad very very quickly in the, in the Bible, and and I think that's just because that's true uh, in in life sometimes, right? And so you you, you see things going very very quickly. Um, so he beheaded him in prison, and, and brings him uh, brings the head. Um, uh, on a platter uh, and gives it to the girl and the girl gives it to the mother. A few things, the, the macabre gr gross image of, of, of a platter, this is like a dinner platter, this would have been, you know, uh, th this would have been what the appetizer was, was, on, was on earlier in the evening, right? Here comes the head. So you get this really sort of grotesque, macabre image, which is a commentary again on, on, on the, on the, on the, banquets of power, right? The banquets of political power, elite power, in contrast to the table which God will set in the Last Supper, right? Um, and, and so it's a very stark, stark contrast. 
and, and again the head is given to the girl and the girl gives the head to the mother we don't hear of Herod ever again right and again that's sort of a, a haunting thing when you think about it because because Herod just disappears from the story right here's here's the the, the, the look at me king with all this pride and ambition and he just disappears from the story right um, and and what is left verse 29 when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. His disciples would have been centered mostly in Judea and the south, and so it probably would have taken a while for them to, to hear of the death of John the Baptist. But what do they do? They came and take his body, and they give it a, 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 a pious burial, giving him honor, right? Because uh, a beheading uh, yeah, would, would have been a particularly degrading execution, right? It was, it was meant to defame, not just kill. Uh, so the disciples honor the death uh, and of the body of, of John the Baptist and lay him in a tomb. And, and the echo obviously is an illusion. The language is the same. We'll come across in chapter 15. John here is being treated like Jesus will be treated when he's dead, right? And, and, so, and so again, the foreshadowing is complete. John foreshadows Jesus in his death. By implication, Jesus foreshadows John in his resurrection. Uh, and us, right? Uh, so the same is true for us. It, to look, it's almost like a mirror image. To to read it for us, we read it and understand that 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 just as John foreshadowed Jesus um, by but in his death, we're supposed to imitate Jesus in our death, right? And just as John anticipated the resurrection by his death, so we expect the resurrection. Uh, after our death, right? And, and and so for any Christian of any time to, to read this and to understand this is, is to, is to um, see what it means to, to be a Christian in the world, right? Um, whether it's the 21st century or, 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 or uh, the first century in Rome, you know, uh, the Christians in, in, in Rome in, in, in the first century hearing this uh, certainly would have related. Um, Christians across the world today certainly would have related. Um, for us, I think it, it, it's we read it on the level of, of you know preparing to be witnesses to the truth, uh, even to the point of becoming martyrs. Uh, but but also it should be a commentary on the way we understand power and and, and what we think power is and, and how we can sometimes be tempted by power. Um, political power, particularly, um, it, it 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 is the gospels, the, whole, the entire Bible, um, make clear over and over and over again. Uh, uh, it, it, it's 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 a it's an ultimately pathetic uh, and violent trap, which we should avoid. Um, that's it for this passage. We're gonna uh, begin on, with verse thirty uh, next time. Uh, but until then, God bless, uh, and we'll see you later.